Good evening. Uh, I'm Ray Kennedy, a uh, member of the Notre Dame Club of Indianapolis Board, and uh, I Jim Krishner for almost 30 years, uh, which is hard to believe. Uh, and welcome to our 2022 version, our Indianapolis version of the Hesburgh Lecture Series, named in honor of Notre Dame's longest serving president and civil rights icon, Father Ted Hesburgh. Tonight we have an outstanding program. First, Dr. Connie Mick of the University of Notre Dame is going to speak to us on fighting poverty through education, connection, and empowerment. Certainly a timely topic given what's going on in our city, state, country, and, and with the election uh, a few days ahead. Dr. Mick is the Senior Associate Director and Director of Academic Affairs at the Center for Social Concerns. She's also the co-director of the Poverty Studies Minor and is editor of the Journal of Poverty and Public Policy. Dr. Mick helps students address core questions about why poverty persists in a world of plenty. Through the center's many community-engaged courses and programs, Dr. Mick encourages students to encounter the people who experience and address poverty firsthand. Coupling this with reliable research from neuroscience, economics, the arts, and more, this talk will invite participants to consider their own understanding and experience with poverty. Second, Nancy Cotterill of locally based Unite Indy will speak to us about what Unite Indy is doing to achieve its vision of Indianapolis having the lowest poverty rate of any major metropolitan city in the U.S. Nancy is an award-winning editorial writer and served as publisher of the Indianapolis Business Journal. At a time when many successful couples would retire and focus on themselves, Nancy and her husband Jim felt a strong calling to do something about poverty in Indianapolis, and five years ago founded Unite Indy. Their story is truly remarkable, and one that hopefully may inspire some of us tonight to become further involved in our own community. And with that said, I will bring Dr. Rick up here.
my grandfather end up there with his fancy tractor, tractors on top of those areas. It takes a lot of digging to get from one of those stories to the other, and in many ways, doing anti-poverty work is exactly that. It's about tilling the soil beneath our feet to understand place and personhood, one story, one person, one human life at a time, to understand the personal, economic, political, social, biological, and family forces that form a person burdened by poverty today. It's about finding connections across time and place and difference that lead to real solidarity and interdependence. So my agenda tonight is to give you a sample of some of the kind of work we do in the Poverty Studies Interdisciplinary Minor that I direct at Notre Dame. This is a small taste of what we do, and sometimes I worry that saying too little can do more, to, more harm than good, but I also believe that aggressive poverty starts with acknowledging something that's often ignored and invisible, and I appreciate the chance to keep the conversation going here, where you're already obviously doing so much good work. So you see that in poverty studies, we ask a lot of questions, and we don't presume always to have all the answers. Uh, so I thought tonight I'll ask a few of the core questions we address in the minor. Why study poverty? How do we define poverty? What causes poverty? What are some of the consequences of poverty? And what can we do about it? Uh, you might be tempted, as my students are, to want to jump to that last question. Uh, this is an urgent, critical issue, right? Lives are literally at stake right now, so let's get busy doing anti-poverty work. Um, but we have to understand the problem before we can address it effectively. Uh, if we rush in to help ignorant or misinformed, we risk making the problem worse, right? We have to be careful. Uh, we want our surgeons to study anatomy, right? We want our engineers to study physics. We should also want our social activists to study people, place, and policy so that the most vulnerable people in our community get our best ideas and actions. In Catholic social teaching terms, this is the preferential option for the poor. The poor deserve our best. And to be clear, when we say study, uh, we do not mean putting other people under the microscope. We instead turn that inspection onto ourselves, studying our personal and social history of poverty, and injustice in the U.S. and around the world. We ask ourselves some hard questions, right? Me and these students are asking these questions of ourselves. And students and professors who've made it to an elite, expensive university even do anti-poverty work? Do we belong in this work? What privileges do we have? And is it possible to harness the power of that privilege to do anti-poverty work? Are our everyday actions perpetuating poverty in any way? Do we have the willpower to make those changes? So the work starts by looking carefully at our own choices and positionality and acknowledging and moving toward accepting that if we aren't actively doing anti-poverty work, then we might be part of the problem. To do nothing is to accept the status quo, which is high, high, high levels of poverty. So but before I unleash these 18 to 21 year olds on the most vulnerable people in our community, I slow them down and ask them to do a lot of listening um, to the research. Listen to the research. In poverty studies, we talk about the importance of stories and stats, statistics, right? We need the statistical understanding that, for example, according to the official poverty measure, in 2021, 12.8% of Americans live below the poverty line. Globally, about 660 million people live in extreme poverty today, less than $1.90 per day. The data can help us understand if a fixed measure of financial poverty is increasing or decreasing over time, and it can help us direct limited resources to those who need it most, right? That's important. But those numbers are so staggering. That is 660 million, right? And sometimes we're numbed by the numbers. We freeze incapable of comprehending the magnitude of the problem. So to bring those numbers to life, we read some really, really, really good books that masterfully combine stats and stories, introducing us to the people behind the numbers. I highly recommend you read some or all of these core poverty books as you hear and throughout the talk. Long, deep studies of the issue are essential. In poverty studies, we talk a lot about what the writer Chimamanda Ngochi Adichie calls the danger of a single story. She's got a wonderful TED talk. She says, power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. The consequence of a single story is this, it robs people of dignity. 
She says this typically happens to people with little, with little power, people experiencing poverty. Thus I offer you not the definitive story of poverty, but my singular story that should be put in conversation with others. You can do that in part by reading widely from texts like these that offer a deep and careful reading of poverty. So as I mentioned, the core principle of how we do poverty studies is that we don't proclaim to have all the answers, and in fact, we relish the questions, because questions invite conversation and not a sense of false certitude. One of the other texts we use in the Introduction to Poverty course is my own reader. It's organized around some of those questions I named for this talk. And while I claim that reading these kinds of texts is essential, I also want to claim that they're not enough. Uh, my textbook is from Oxford University Press. The others are all from top presses as well. But they pale in, in comparison to the personal stories we tell in person. I caution my students on the first day of class not to assume that poverty is um, something that happens to other people in other places. I tell them that we should assume that people in the room have vastly different kinds of experiences we should hear, but some students don't realize that until another student or I tell my own personal story about poverty. My textbook shows one kind of expertise about poverty, but to be honest, uh, the most effective lessons are when I talk about my family's personal experience with poverty. I told you that I grew up in the suburbs. And for many people, that automatically signals wealth. It typically does signal more community-level stability, but there is significant poverty in the suburbs, as researcher Scott Allard explains in his book, Places in Need, The Changing Geography of Poverty. We didn't talk about poverty in the suburbs until researchers decided to look for it. <laughs> they assumed it wasn't there, that it wasn't significant, but it is. What's hard about experience poverty in suburbs and rural areas is that the infrastructure is lacking, right? No public transportation, few food banks, few social services, and such. You don't serve something that you don't realize is there, right? It helps my students to hear about my own childhood experience with the instability of poverty, of food insecurity, foreclosure, Pell Grants, nearly being kicked out of college for overdue bills, etc. Then later in life, taking in my mother when she developed early Alzheimer's. I learned all about Medicare and Medicaid in my 30s. I know firsthand how life can throw you curveballs that shake your foundation, and those curves have kept coming for me. On August 8th of 2021, my husband Brad passed away unexpectedly. I stepped into my Introduction to Poverty Studies classroom 10 days after his service, and it, it changed the way I teach. Uh, particularly how I teach empathy, right, or experience it. I let the students know about his death. Uh, I have daughters that are about their age, and I realize that some of them, so the students sitting in the classroom probably had pain of their own as well. And I brought them into my journey as it related to the course. For example, I let them know when I discovered this that the Social Security death benefit for surviving spouses is $255. It's an absurd amount, right, in every way. Not only is it a weird number, like just round it up and down. You know, it's not going to make a difference to me, but I bet there are some low-income widows for whom that would be powerful, and I would much rather that my share would go to them. So we have some, you know, we talk then about how we have some well-intentioned policies that don't do as much good as they could when sometimes we value equality, treating everybody the same, over equity, giving people what they need. So a key lesson in poverty studies is also to get past those good intentions and to think critically about what we're doing. So sharing at this deeper level has helped stu students open up to me about their own stories of poverty and loss. For example, I have a student who has a wonderful scholarship to Notre Dame, and the university has done incredible work in the last 10 years or so to make sure that low-income low income students can come to Notre Dame and survive and thrive there. We know that higher levels of education increase lifelong earnings significantly. So this is a wonderful anti-poverty effort. So this student has that support. However, he missed some assignments, and I said, hey, what's going on? He said, well, I'm working at Kroger's as much as I can. I said, why are you doing that? He's doing that to help his younger brother, who doesn't have the same kind of scholarship. Poverty is a family problem. I, the same thing happened in my family when my sister was a, College. My mother borrowed my, the money I had made babysitting. 
Uh, it was a great investment. She got her MD from Indiana University. It was paid off. But you know, those are the kinds of challenges that 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 are so complicated in understanding poverty. And on top of it, there's all the shame, right? Um, must have put our whole stories on the table and studied all those factors that make it so difficult to achieve financial financial stability, let alone social mobility in the U.S. Um, we can we can do a lot of judging and, and not enough understanding, I think. So some of that understanding comes through researchers like Harvard, uh, researcher Raj Chetty. He provides some of the most compelling evidence about the significance of place in the study of poverty. This is one of the first lessons we cover in poverty studies. Place matters, right? The country you're born into, the state, the city, the neighborhood, the home, and the body, right? The place you carry with you. All those factors uh, heavily influence, but of course do not totally determine our lifelong health and well-being. Chetty's research shows us how significant our zip codes are to our lifelong prosperity. There's research in what he calls low and high mobility areas, places where the odds of a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution makes that leap all the way up to the top fifth of the income distribution. The classic American rags to riches story. On this map, the red areas are low opportunity and the blue areas are higher opportunity. So his research defines high mobility areas, um, the places where that rise is more likely, as having the following five characteristics. One, less residential segregation. Two, larger middle class. Three, more stable family structure. Four, greater social capital. And five, better school quality. He then shows, through analysis of big data, how much a child who moves from a low to a high opportunity area increases their odds of rising from the lowest to the highest income level as an adult. This is the exact same child, different place, different outcome in a different place. Obviously, we can't just go around moving kids, right? Instead, the goal is to transform every area into a high opportunity place where people are healthier, happier, and go on to achieve their highest potential. My mom knew enough to move us into a high opportunity area with high quality public schools. I took all the APs and at my public school and had you know, great enrichment opportunities like band, you know, built into the curriculum. It wasn't paid to participate. Uh, and I was expected in that environment to, to go on to college and to succeed. Those positive protective factors impacted my standing at the lectern today. So how do we define poverty? Let's back up and define it, right? Because when we operate with different definitions, um, we do different things, right? Uh, in 1964, President Johnson declared an unconditional war on poverty in the State of the Union address, but he needed a way to know if we were winning or losing that, that war, right? So he called on folks to create a measurement tool, which we still use today. We set our annual poverty line in the U.S. by looking at pre-tax cash income and the expense of three times the cost of a minimum food diet in today's prices. This is widely understood to be <laughs> insufficient and, and difficult. So we now have the supplemental poverty measure as well. I don't want to get into those details. So I mean, that, that's my, my point is that we have been defining poverty strictly in financial terms. It's about money, right? Um, and that can be helpful. The benefit of this kind of measurement tool is that it lets us see, for example, that child poverty rates in the U.S. remain higher than the national average. These darker saturation areas mean a higher child poverty rates. And that rates vary widely state by state, place by place, right? That's important to know what's working, what isn't. Globally, financial measures allow us to see that extreme poverty rates have been falling, but the pandemic, whoop, you know, crush that progress, right? We see in 2019, so I want to see that sharp uptick, uptick in poverty, um, whereas we expected it to keep going down. It, it went another direction, right? Um, but so we think more broadly in our study of poverty. It's not just that money. The money matters, but we take a more multi-dimensional view. Economist and philosopher Marta Sen, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics, argues poverty is not just a lack of money. It's not having the capability to realize one's full potential as a human being. Do you have the power to live up to your potential, to do what you want to do and be who you want to be? Money is a factor in reaching those goals, but social restrictions, such as discrimination based on race, religion, gender, ex-offender status, etc., can prevent people from full, full participation. Brian Stevenson, a public interest lawyer for the poor and the incarcerated
Serena, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative and author of Just Mercy, says, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. In too many places, there's a word again, in too many places, the opposite of poverty is justice. So we can think about poverty as the expression of injustice. It's multidimensional, including financial, social, and spiritual exclusion that can prevent people from living into their full capabilities. So exactly what is preventing people from full participation in society? What are the barriers that keep people from full participation in places of plenty? Each individual person has a different story of poverty, right? We can't totally generalize, but we can consider two general categories, uh, what I call natural causes and unnatural causes, right? Just to bucket them. Natural causes are challenges that come without malice or mercy from Mother Nature herself. Generally speaking, this includes diseases, environmental disasters, and the physical and mental challenges programmed into our bodies from birth. These are challenges that no one chooses and that at this point no one can stop. A tornado does what a tornado does, no matter who you are, what you have. If you don't have a sufficient personal or public safety net to recover from that loss, though, this kind of disaster can cause short or long-term poverty. What I call unnatural or human causes are when people get in the way. And there are more ways than I can name here, but I'm sure you know that people set up barriers for themselves and others in many ways. The scope of those actions ranges from ignorance, right, we just didn't know this would harm someone else, to indifference, we knew it would hurt, but eh, we can't do anything about it, to full-on conscious exploitation, right? Uh, I think we don't talk about that aspect enough. Those barriers can happen on the societal level through policies that can help, that can prevent flourishing. And they can happen on the level of businesses or individuals who take advantage of vulnerable people. And they can happen through personal choices. One example on the societal level is incarceration. This is one of the key issues, I believe, that United ID has taken up. The U.S. has chosen a system of mass incarceration. Uh, research by Michelle Alexander and others and the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness illustrates the consequences of this practice. Mass incarceration impacts the individual in ways that make it difficult for them to re-enter society, to find just employment and housing. It also disrupts and drains the lives of the partners, parents, and children of those incarcerated, increasing the risk of poverty for the family and destabilizing communities. As a side note, the Center for Social Concerns, where I'm housed as faculty member, has just become the home for the Notre Dame Prison Education Program. Uh, a set of initiatives that support Notre Dame faculty teaching inside prison, often with Notre Dame undergraduate students and graduate students, but more broadly, we're interested in researching the most effective ways to understand and address crime and justice. And of course, we have examples from our own history where the federal government has redlined neighborhoods as being worthy or unworthy of financial investment, typically along racial and class lines, reinscribing marginality for generations to come. Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, provides insight on this. Although there's still unofficial segregation, right, it still happens, we did try to rethink those policies, and there's hope that we can continue to make smarter, more effective, more just public policy. And of course, Pope Francis on, on poverty, one of the most clear articulations of the ecosystem of causes and consequences comes from Pope Francis in his address at Patriarchal Church of St. George, Istanbul. He says, in today's world, voices are being raised which we cannot ignore and which implore our churches to live deeply our identity as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first of these voices is that of the poor. In the world, there are too many women and men who suffer from severe malnutrition, growing unemployment, the rising numbers of unemployed youth and from increasing social exclusion, right? The active exclusion of others. These can give rise to criminal activity and even the recruitment of terrorists. We cannot remain indifferent before the cries of our brothers and sisters. These acts give us not only material assistance needed in so many circumstances, but above all, our help to defend their dignity as persons so that they can find the spiritual energy to become once again the protagonists in their own life. I love that phrase, the protagonists in their own lives. They ask us to fight in the light of the gospel the structural causes of poverty, 
inequality, the shortage of dignified work and housing, and the denial of their rights as members of society and workers. As Christians, we're called together to eliminate that globalization of indifference, right? Which to say seems, today seems to reign supreme while building a new civil civilization of love and solidarity, right? Getting rid of that globalization of indifference and embracing love, solidarity. So what are those consequences of poverty? What's at stake here? Pope Francis doesn't answer that in this passage. He simply says that Christians are called to address this, but why? I think it's important to imagine the individual and social harms caused by poverty. Through our definition of poverty, we say that it's about more than not just not having nice things, right? It's about living up to our individual potential to live with human dignity, which most religions and ethical traditions say is innate, right? We have that in us already. Martin Luther King Jr. and others argue that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, right? We are connected like roots in a system, right? If the preaching doesn't convince you that poverty causes deep harm to individuals and communities, I would invite you to consider the insights of neuroscience, one of our key partners in poverty studies at Notre Dame. Advances in neuroscience explain what happens to the body when trauma happens to children, adults, and communities, and poverty can be traumatic. This is an image we use uh, to show the chaotic universe of challenges people can face. These are known as adverse childhood and community experiences, ACEs for short. By number one here, the tree, we see household adversity, such as divorce, homelessness, incarcerated family members, domestic violence, alcoholism, and drug abuse. By number two there, with community, we see challenges such as substandard schools, substandard wages, food scarcity, poor water and air quality, violence, and historical trauma. By number three, environment, we see things like record heat and droughts, Record storms, flooding, and mudslides, earthquakes, pandemics. A child under 18 years old cannot control any of these things. Uh, an under-resourced adult can control a little more unless they know how to navigate those support system uh, and services such as homeless shelters and, and public assistance. A well-resourced adult might not be able to prevent most of these challenges either, right? They, the same things come at us. Uh, but they can mitigate that damage by securing strong private and public safety nets. An adult with resources can pay for insurance, high quality childcare, high quality schooling, therapy, vacation to reduce stress, or even a move to a higher opportunity area with less adversity. Well resourced adults can't prevent adversity, but their financial and social connections often make it possible for them to recover from such challenges more fully and quickly. Neuroscience teaches us that whatever our age or resource level, we respond to it personally in roughly the same physical way. We fight, flee, or freeze, right, when confronted with, with a, a, a challenge, right? Our limbic system, our reptilian brain, suppresses our prefrontal cortex, our learning and thinking executive functioning brain, and we live in the moment, uh, trying to address that danger in front of us, putting all our energy into that. Um, that conflict, right? Low levels of stress are manageable and even productive, right? But some people live with so much chronic stress that it becomes toxic. Nadine Burke Harris, Harris uh, pediatrician and now Surgeon General of California, has an amazing TED Talk and an even better book, which we read in the Poverty Studies Capstone course called The Deepest Well, the Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity. She says this response system works great if the danger is short-lived and discreet. For example, we turn the corner in a forest and there's a bear in front of us, right? We want our body to put all its energy into survival, right? But as Dr. Brooke Harris says, when the bear is a chronic presence, the bear is actually an abusive parent who comes home every night. Or the bear is, a, is systemic racism or housing and food insecurity that you face every day. Our bodies get physically stuck in that fight, flee, or freeze mode, and our brains start responding to everything as danger. The body can handle stress for short periods of time, but when it becomes chronic, again, it becomes toxic. We aren't wired to live like that, uh, and we disrupt the brain power to think long-term about how to get away from those dangers and how to plan for a safer, healthier future. So if a child grows up in a household with personal, community, and envi or environmental adversities, those challenges increase the risk for additional destructive outcomes if and only if they are not stopped 
through the intervention of caring, competent adults, and then mitigate it through appropriate healing processes. Neuroscience helps us understand that the brain adapts its wiring to its environment. Survival skills that work well in one environment don't always serve us well in other environments. Being hyper alert can be protective with a drunken, abusive adult in the house. It can be counterproductive when a teacher tells you to sit quietly and do your work, right? Trauma-informed care is the practice of understanding those connections and responding in healing ways that acknowledge these important biological factors. One of the most important studies in this area is the Kaiser Permanente study of adverse childhood experiences. This large-scale study asked 10 questions about childhood adversity to better understand the frequency and consequences of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, and to guide, the goal was to guide care and response, right? Uh, from the screening, uh, which was developed for physicians and counselors and others, um, the idea was to develop awareness with the hope that treatment would follow. Um, for example, the study found that people with four or more of these ACEs on, on a 10-point scale, right, they answered positively. Um, folks who, who register at four or more ACEs are about 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. Seeing a strong correlation like this helps us better understand the consequence of early adversity. And it's not meant to stigmatize under-resourced individuals and communities. No one is immune to ACEs. The original study was actually done on a largely white middle-class demographic, and nearly one in six in that study reported that they'd experienced four or more types of ACEs. So the question then becomes, why do some people survive and even thrive despite those ACEs, while well, others do not? One of the most important reasons is the more recent complementary study of the impact of positive childhood experiences. We also have to measure what builds us up, what sustains us, what develops resilience. Positive childhood experiences include things such as the support of those caring, competent adults, right? Uh, access to, to good food, fun, safe home, right? The things that give us joy build us up. They build our reserves. So a better calculation of childhood well-being is what we call a PACE approach, looking at positive and adverse childhood and community experiences. This expanded analysis looks at home and neighborhood, negative and positive experiences to more holistically understand well-being. Research shows that the impact of those positive experiences can outweigh the impact of adverse experiences. But unfortunately, under-resourced individuals and communities are more, more exposure to, to adversity and typically have less access to afford healing responses, thus they're doubly disadvantaged. This article in the Journal of the American Medical Association outlines the consequences of this unmitigated cycle of adversity, and they're serious. Uh, the authors researched deaths of despair, deaths of despair which they define as deaths from suicide and drug poisoning related to addictions. Uh, their research is heartbreaking. And what you need to understand from this figure is that the dark line going up to the right shows how these deaths of despair are rising in the U.S. compared to Western Europe, Canada, Australia, and Japan. Our numbers are pretty extreme, right? This research connects us to the research on unmitigated childhood adversity and takes it a step farther. The researchers make an explicit connection to poverty and whom they identify as succumbing to these deaths of despair. They say as the income gap widens, life cycle challenges for those near the bottom of the income bracket are felt to be unsurmountable because increasingly they are insurmountable. This is what causes despair and attenuates the desire to live. Hard stuff, right? I mean, neuroscience, psychiatry, and anthropology show us that these unmitigated adversity experiences can lead to shorter, harder lives, and those shorter, harder lives are hard on everyone. We lose out, all of us, when one of us isn't able to live up to their potential. Lawyer uh, Heather McGee makes a case for this argument in her book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. She writes about changing our collective mindset from a position of scarcity and zero sum where, where someone has to lose for somebody else to gain, making it hard for us to kind of get on board collectively to prevent poverty. And since, she says, we need to embrace a mindset of abundance and interdependence. She writes, everywhere I went, I found that the people who had replaced the zero sum with a new formula of cross-racial solidarity 
had found the key to unlocking what I began to call a solidarity dividend. That's beautiful. From higher wages to cleaner air, made possible through collective action. And when we work together, we all get more out of it. Where we stand together, everyone flourishes and is integrated. Everyone does better. So what can we do about this? You know, there's no end to what we can do. The big things and the small things all count. First, we need to hold on to the belief that we can end poverty, right? People don't accomplish things they don't believe in. And I believe we can make room for everyone who's able to work to have just employment that allows people to work with dignity and joy. My students believe that and act on it as well. They're developing this moral imagination that gives them space to transcend the chaos and trauma of our current world to work towards something better. The students have the benefit of dedicating time to the study of poverty, and I introduce them to just as many voices and examples of addressing poverty as possible. For example, we hear from Professor Jim Sullivan at Notre Dame's lab for economic opportunity, who talks about their rigorous evaluation of social programs to see what actually works in anti-poverty programming. We hear from Professor Judy Fox at the Legal Aid Clinic to see how they're addressing the destabilizing challenge of eviction in the local community. This helps us personalize the housing issues um, that, that we read about in Matthew Desmond's Pulitzer Prize when he book Evicted. Um, we look at it's more research I've done on, on the Main Street South Bend encampment of people experiencing homelessness in South Bend. We hear from community experts at the Center for the Homeless and from the new incredibly successful Motels for Now Housing First initiative started by folks at the Catholic Worker in South Bend when streets of homelessness grew downtown during COVID. They had a remarkable response to that. It's ongoing. And we talk about the Just Wage Initiative defined through Catholic social teaching, which my colleague, Dan, historian Dan Graff, uh, designed through these examples. Students see many forms of anti-poverty work uh, they can participate in throughout their lives. My goal is not for them to take up any one type of anti-poverty issue or profession. Uh, we're not training them for a specific job. Notre Dame doesn't have a social work degree, for example. We're trying to form them for a way of being in their work and in their lives that transforms the face of poverty. On the last day of teaching the Introduction to Poverty course this year, we, we talked about what anti-poverty work we were each committed to pursuing. We looked at a wheel for social change that identifies different types of activities. Students can practice everything from activism to philanthropy. Some students were planning to do post-grad service, but most were not. They were going on to medical school. Med school found uh, neuroscience majors are the largest group of poverty studies minors. Uh, they're going to law school, accounting and consulting practice, graduate school, various other jobs in business, government, and nonprofit sectors. And that's exactly what I want. I want students to follow their passion and practice that with an understanding of how they can address poverty and injustice wherever they are, right? And if they're in positions of leadership, use that vantage point. Uh, to, to create uh, a more just space for those who touch. As we share with his intentions, a finance teacher said with what seemed like a new awareness to him, so we don't have to be saints? You know, I, I love saint as much as the next person, but I don't know how to create a minor for that. Um, I'm investing in everyday good people who want to be informed about poverty and injustice and who will act with care on that information from whatever professional perch they choose. We need Catholic workers, and we need finance workers who consider poverty, and we need them all talking to each other. That happens in these interdisciplinary poverty studies classes, and my hope is that students recreate those transformative encounters wherever they go after graduation. I received evidence of this, like the answer to a prayer, uh, when a student from the Spring 2020 Senior Capstone class emailed me just last week. Andrea was an engineering major with a poverty studies minor. We don't get many of those because engineering curriculum is so tight that it's really hard, but Andrea was determined to make it work. And I'll share a bit of this email from her uh, with her permission. It's addressed to all of her engineering professors and me. Uh, she informs us that she took a job at Stantec in Pasadena, California after graduation, so just a few months ago. She loves it, and Andrea writes, my job is split into two components, the technical side and the community engagement side. For those of you who don't know, I minored in poverty studies, hence why I'm sending this to Dr. Mick as well. I always thought the importance of community engagement and working with the community was extremely, extremely relevant in environmental engineering. 
Water is a human right, and it pains me that people still struggle with water security all around the world. However, in engineering, it's often easy to forget the community component of the job, which is critical when it comes to developing a project for the public that's sustainable. There are a lot of trust issues in relation to tap water here in California. Disadvantaged communities experience this the most, especially since some of these communities have experienced cases of contaminated water. I am working with a leadership group composed of representatives from different community-based organizations and tribal organizations of many communities in the region. We're currently developing a program with the intent of closing some, wa some water quality data gaps and educating community members on water quality and safety. Dr. Nick, I keep going back to our senior capstone class. Really, all the outreach strategies, the importance of utilizing appropriate and inclusive vocabulary, the complications surrounding the trust building process, all of it has been extremely relevant. I love that. So Andrea is blown away, as I am, that she's able to put the study of poverty into practice so quickly. But I'm not surprised that she's doing it so well. As part of her reflection on her capstone, uh, Andrea painted this image here, which now sits atop my desk. In her artist statement, she explains that the falling flowers are a symbol of harmful community and personal choices. The red umbrella represents life, sinking from the harms that weigh it down. The umbrellas in the sky represent protective factors, and the flower with the green stem represents a healthy world that will flourish if we can get that red umbrella safely to the shore. So Andrea clearly has the moral imagination to see and create a just world free from poverty. And one final example of what can be done in this time, it comes from a Notre Dame uh, Peace Studies professor colleague, Pat Reagan. Pat had been teaching in our prison education program in Westville Correctional Facility. He asked his students one day what he could do to help them get on their feet on re-entry post-incarceration. They said, you can hire us. Nobody will hire us. That was a, a little taken aback. He was a professor, not a business person, but he took on the, on the challenge. As a professor, he researched the connection between peace and environmental instability. The most vulnerable people bear the brunt of environmental degradation, living with toxic water, as Andrea mentioned, and air and hostile terrain. Here, Pat's moral imagination kicked in. He retired from Notre Dame, he found a business partner, and they started Crossroads Solar in South Bend. Uh, their mission is to produce top-quality solar panels with people who have made mistakes, creating second chances and a greener earth one panel at a time. Our employees are released felons who have served their time and earned the opportunity to re-enter the workforce with dignity. It's a for-profit business. Their goal is to be self-sufficient and not to need endless funding, right? It's brilliant, it's bold, it's risky. You know, it invests in people and the environment at the same time. Pat listened, he did the research, he took action, and he continues to revise and improve this approach. It's pretty amazing. So, can we talk more about people who address poverty and less about the, the programs themselves? Uh, my focus is, as an educator is on who works, and, and, and a lot of things work. Um, you can look at their Dame's Lab for Economic Opportunity, you can read that Journal of Poverty and Public Policy, um, but programs aren't designed or de delivered without creative, caring people, right? Who believe that things can and should get better, people who don't just do charity on the side, but who define their lives by dedication to ending poverty and injustice. So I'm giving you some homework. Uh, that's what I do, that's how I end all my, all my talks. Um, your homework is you know, to dig up and tell your own story of poverty. Name and reckon with your own history, and your own Properties and privileges uh, in your life. And do, do that work yourself that we do with the students. Um, to continue to move from ignorance or indifference to informed inclusive action, read widely and deeply. There's no one story, no, none of us gets it all right. So just keep listening, right? Listen to people with direct experience in all different forms. And partner with organizations like Unite Indy that are powered by love, strategy, and solidarity. Uh, thank you. Well, as I told Dr. Mack as I was walking up, I can't follow that. Uh, I did see so much in what you said 
in our work, but far less uh, well said. <laughs> and just as Dr. Mick said, 50 years ago, the war on poverty was coined by Lyndon Johnson. And since that time, there have been generations of Americans who have fought in that war. You've heard from her uh, with other social scientists. They rise above the fray to analyze and, for the rest of us, show us the movements of the enemy that is poverty. Then there are the foot soldiers. And I guess in this analogy, that is United Nations. We're the boots on the ground, working strategically by uniting businesses, government, churches, volunteers, and other not-for-profits to fight this shared battle. United is approaches to provide the one-on-one -on -one care and strategic assistance that we believe Christ would give. In general, we're a lot less about handouts and a lot more about providing a handout. Some of our first efforts were to bring fresh insights into our public square. We had two publications inserted into the Indianapolis Business Journal and the Indianapolis Recorder, which is the oldest black newspaper in the country. The first one was called Building Race Relationships, which obviously explored issues of race in our city. The second was Indy's Urban Employment Crisis, and that one shocked some people. The average unemployment figure for the U.S. at the time was historically low. It was 3.9%. But what most people did not know and learned from our publication was that in the urban core, the unemployment figure stood at 21%. In fact, across the country, whatever the unemployment rate is, you'll find that poor urban areas have an unemployment rate three to eight times higher, and that's in good economic times and in bad. Why is that? Well, in a black urban neighborhood, we can automatically say there were few, fewer job opportunities that go back generations. But there are plenty of poor white areas, too. After doing this for five years in Marion and surrounding counties, one issue became pretty obvious to us. It was that one thing that seemed to always be there in the history of the person we were working with. The statistics point to it, too, and that is the overwhelming common thread we see. It is the lack of a father in the home. It contributes greatly to an increase in poverty, an increase in crime, and finally to an increase in incarceration. One example, one study found that individuals from father absent homes are 279% more likely to carry guns and deal drugs than peers who live with their fathers. A study in 2011 found that children living in female-headed homes with no spouse had a poverty rate of 47.6%, over four times the rate for children living in homes with two parents. Another study, the most damning, I think, shows that 75% of juveniles in prison say they had no father figure in the home. The issue is less about single moms than you might think. These examples, more than anything, reflect the, dis the declining perceived value of fathers in our society. The 60s war on poverty began to pay mothers according to how many children they had. Social workers in the 70s literally visited those receiving child support payments to verify the absence of a male presence, searching bathrooms for razors and closets for men's clothing. What was an effort to help poor mothers became a powerful force to crack the foundation of marriage in poor minority neighborhoods where these neighborhoods were white, where these programs were widely used. The percentage of marriages in all races has decreased since the 50s. But in urban communities, the result was devastating. In the 50s, black and white people married at about the same rate, about 90%. By the late 60s, black marriages had dropped to 50%. And by 2010, they hit a new low of 27%. According to our society's group think today, fathers in general, and black fathers in particular, have never been more irrelevant. Today, generations of children have grown up, repeated the single parent pattern, and have given birth to the term generational poverty. In our opinion, gener generational poverty has created the poverty to prison pipeline. Here's a real life example. A few years ago, I began writing to an inmate named Jesse, who was in prison in Greencastle, Indiana. Jesse was five when he witnessed his alcoholic mother being beaten 
with a hammer by her latest boyfriend. He and his siblings, who all had different fathers, were shuttled off to foster care, where he remained until he was pushed out of the system at age 18. He never saw anyone go to work every day. He never had anyone promote education, responsibility, integrity, or even much kindness. He served 22 years in prison for various illegal acts and is now free. But he still struggles to make good decisions around basic issues that you and I learn to handle just by watching our parents. Think about it. How many of you grew up near a rural area where there were farms? I did. My friends growing up on a farm were driving huge tractors as soon as their legs were long enough to reach the clutch. No one even gave them lessons. They had been riding on their father's knee around the farm since they were two. It was just part of their map. They all went to church together, another map. They worked on the farm. They respected their parents. We all have unique maps that inform our lives for the rest of our lives, whether they're good or bad. According to early childhood studies, by the time we're five years old, we have learned the most important lessons we will need to negotiate and maintain a happy life. And we learn those from our parents. But for many, that homeschool house just did not exist. So how do we at Unite Indy work to put some of these important maps into the lives of reentrants who may not have ever received that kind of education, but also have prison culture imprinted in their souls? The first step, the most important step, is to show them that we really care about them. We are kind. We show them that we respect them in their journeys and help them get settled with housing, food, clothing, uh, connection to a drug abatement program, whatever it is they need. And then we get down to work and we train them. And that training is loving as well. We provide a map most of them have never seen before. In many ways, it's like giving a lost driver a Google map app. All of a sudden, they know what direction they should go. So our Google Map app is Jobs for Life. Jobs for Life is an internationally recognized, biblically-based course that teaches that our Creator made us to work. That work is a good thing, as it stresses the importance of character, integrity, and honesty. We give each student a mentor who stays with them through the course, and then we teach them to write a resume, to get a job, how to get a job, and to be completely honest about their criminal history. We teach what an employer will expect and why and how to advance in a company, and a lot more. The Bible says if one does not work, he will not eat. And I have to be completely honest with you here. I thought my father came up with that. <laughs> but actually, it was Paul who said it, and I learned he was right. One issue, though, that continued to come up was that taking this course involved a lot of reading. And that was a stumbling block for a lot of people we were working with. So with the help of the Criminal Justice Department at Indiana Wesleyan University, the lessons have been animated. It's still a serious learning opportunity, but now the whole 10-week course is easier to digest and more accessible to a much broader audience. The path to success was getting smoother, but the problem remained that too many companies were still unwilling to hire those with a criminal, with a criminal record. Reentrants might knock on 100 doors, maybe find someone who would hire them for $8 an hour to sweep a floor. That is not a living wage, and jobs like that have fueled recidivism for decades. So in 2019, United Indy began working to develop a network of employers here who were willing to hire those with a criminal record. With that portfolio of jobs, we built a website called secondchanceindy.com. Now there's no more going door to door to have them slammed in your face. These jobs pay a living wage. We're talking $18, $19, $20 an hour and more. And these employers understand and work around court-mandated things like drug tests and the need to meet a parole officer during the day. The program of training, mentorship, and job acquisition was really working, but more jobs were needed because every year, just consider this, in Marion County alone, and we work in the nine county area, in Marion County alone, we have 12,000 people being at least every year, excuse me, from incarceration. Anecdotally, people were saying that these reentrants made great employees. In fact, better than some employees with no criminal record. We knew if we could get proof, we could sign on more employer partners and get more jobs for reentrants. 
So we asked Butler University's Lacey School of Business to see if the anecdotal evidence could be proven. In a groundbreaking study, over a year and a half, researchers combed employment records and interviewed human resource executives. And here's what they said. There is no statistical evidence, there's no st statistical difference between the on-the-job performance of a person with a criminal record and one without. And surprisingly, this is great, they found that more ser the more serious the offense, say a felony versus a misdemeanor, the more serious the offense, the better the employee. Armed with this study, we've been able to expand our employer partner base on secondchanceindy.com to more than 40 employers today. Reentrants now get training, mentor support, and job availability. What else could they possibly need? Well, they needed help with the number one barrier to getting and keeping a good job, the lack of dependable transportation. So over the past two and a half years, we've been testing and now running a transportation program that uses 16 vans that seat 15 passengers each to take employees to and from work five days a week to employers all over central Indiana. And that program will soon be expanded. And because of this dependable transportation, our reentrant employees have a lower no-call, no-show record than employees without a criminal record. That is a big deal. In other words, they are the most dependable employees these companies have. Both the city of Indianapolis and the state of Indiana are helping to support that program because it reduces recidivism, it cuts taxes for taxpayers, and most importantly, it supports an increase in income and a reduction in the poverty situation for re-entrants and their families. Here's the bottom line. We spend over half a billion dollars just for state prisons in Indiana every year. That's a billion with a B. And that doesn't even include county jails. And in Marion County, for example, within three years of release, statistically 46% will be reincarcerated. But for those who are employed soon after release, studies show we can reduce, we can drive down recidivism by as much as 90%. So take that 46%, change it to 4.6%. That is a huge difference. What we've learned is that by training and employing those who are released from incarceration, over time, we can change the face of recidivism and even poverty in central Indiana. This is what good jobs, good pay, and a connected team of caring people can accomplish. We are effective because we have united our efforts with businesses, churches, volunteers, universities, and other nonprofits to attack this very big, very complex social issue. Through education and connection, United Indy empowers re-entrance to find self-respect, dignity, and restoration every day through the virtue of work. Oh, thank you. We are gonna take a couple of minutes and do a Q and A. Um, we've got, hopefully with the group, everybody can, can hear us if we just have a question. Um, so if you can, maybe stand up if you have one, and, uh, and oh, sorry. Where is Unite Indy locally? Where are you? We're located in 241 West 38th Street in Indianapolis. 241 West 38th? Yes. Do you have an email address? Yes. Uh, info at uniteindy.org. you say that again? Info at uniteindy.org is our email. We're, we live in... Uh, live in our, our office, and we do live there, <laughs> is in uh, 46208, and that we have 40% poverty level in that zip code. We wanted to be in an area of the NER. What is the process for choosing or who gets to be in the program? I, I'm sorry. What is the process for someone that is incarcerated and comes out 
to, to choose who gets to be in the cross program. We work closely with correctional facilities, and we are, in fact, it's been, we've been put off a lot because of the pandemic, but we will be teaching in the New Marion County Jail, so we will doing the, be doing the Jobs for Life courses, but we also work with correctional facilities that have um, people that are in halfway houses, they're not really released yet, but they are living outside prison walls, and we have classes for people like that, so we work, we work with them to get these people. But if someone wants to join the class, we would never tell them no. What can we do to further your cause? Uh, donate is always a great thing. <laughs> there's, there's always a need for that. Uh, Volunteer? Oh, well, yes, absolutely. We use mentors for all of our training. Uh, the concepts that we teach are not strange to anyone in this room, probably, but if someone grows up like Jesse did, the concepts are foreign, and they do need help to walk through them. Thank you. That's great. Great point. We do need volunteers. If, if a business wanted to hire one, Just, if you just send us an email, we can add you to secondchanceindy.com, and then we'll be on the, uh, on the online, and they can read about it. And, and the beauty of Second Chance Indy is that they can read about the job. It'll tell you if there are any things that, you, that a person might have done uh, that, that wouldn't allow them to work there. Obviously, there's some fences you wouldn't put into a nursery home, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but they can apply right on Uh, Dr. Big, if you were to recommend, there's a lot of great books up there that uh, were in your presentation. If you were to recommend one for someone who might be, um, this might be a new topic, and is there one that you would particularly think of that's kind of a low barrier of entry? Is, is a easier to an audience that might want to learn but be a little bit less? Uh... Yeah, great question. I think I think story based um, <laughs> books help, right? Just meet a person and get to know their story, follow them along. And I think Andrea Elliott's Invisible Child does that incredibly well. You follow a family over time. Elliott is a journalist, so you know, she's a storyteller, not a social scientist, but does a really careful job of following a family over a long period of time. That's what's valuable about it as well. So it's not a snapshot, it's like, wow, what was this elementary school like? What was high school like? And so it follows a family and you know, navigating complexity of social services in New York City. So, you know, there's no, there's no one book, right? But, the, but that one, I think, helps you see, oh, those are those are bad choices and constrained circumstances, right? I don't know why they did that, but I see that they didn't have a lot of choices. And, I don't know, you just start to get inside um, that experience a little more because it's so deep and so complex. Yes, and you may have addressed this, I apologize, but do you also offer or help um, people with the Unites program or the Jobs for Life program with training? Let's say they've never had official training and maybe a trade or, or something like that for, for whatever employment. Do they get a, it, it that is, kind of training? We don't get into trades. Uh, there are places that we can tell people to go, though. There are, you know, charitable organizations that will work to train some trades. So, so some of your partners that you work with mm -hmm. would do that? Okay. If you want to learn about poverty, I suggest you join C. Vincenti Paul. Yeah. The hallmark of C. Vincenti Paul is doing home visits, and that's where you see poverty face to face. Uh, right now, we're helping St. Andrews. Their zip code is 46218. In the past five months, we've got over 250 calls for help. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, on Wednesday, we went to visit a young lady, well, young to me, she's about 35, has six kids. Uh, she has a job, though, she's working. Went into her living room and there was no light. So I asked her if she wanted to get a lamp. She said, well, she said, sure. But the reason we went there is uh, the lady I went with had a form to fill out for help with uh, the Christmas tour for Catholic Charities. 
and yet lists the name of all the kids, sick kids, and name of all the kids who have a presencing one. And yet fill out their last name. Uh, her name was different from five of her kids. And of her five kids, they didn't have the same last name. So, if you want to experience poverty, face it's reading a book is one thing and it's fine, but getting out there and seeing it in person is a totally different story. It brings it home in, a, in an amazing way. I agree. Can I just add to that? So I emphasize sort of research because I think we talk about that less. Uh, one of the core elements of our minor is experiential learning. We want to be prepared for those kinds of engagement, but that is a necessary piece of understanding poverty is meeting people face to face, but being sort of ready for that so that we don't reinscribe stereotypes and, and things, right? That we're sort of prepared and we can process those meetings. So with experts like Nancy and others who have those relationships, being invited in um, to have, you know, ideally longer term uh, relationship building opportunities, there's, there's no substitute for that. That has to be an addition uh, to understanding poverty for sure. Meeting I mean, you painted a broad brush with respect to uh, contributions toward the poverty, but I don't know what your approach is with respect to mental health, which is a major contributor to homelessness and poverty. And the state of Indiana and the Marion County in particular has not done a great job addressing mental illness with respect to homelessness and poverty. So could you kind of say something about that? Yeah, I talked really fast, so I still couldn't get to everything I wanted to. Uh, so my husband worked at the, um, the the clubhouse of St. Joseph County uh, up in South Bend before he died, and that's a comprehensive mental health organization that provides safe community for folks experiencing you know extreme uh, mental challenges. Uh, our community has far too few providers, few too opportunity, too few opportunities for folks to get. You know, medical and the therapeutic help they need, and too few opportunities to, to not feel that social exclusion as well, right? So that's what some, some place like you know, Clubhouse does, and that's an international organization. You can look that up. I can imagine, I know there's um, Clubhouses in, in Indianapolis as well, you know, just getting folks work experience, yeah. right? Indiana is rated among the very lowest in health care opportunities for people with mental health. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's People can identify the need and we don't have a service. But I, will, to but I will say that we're making some efforts in the correctional facilities. Uh, the new Marion County Jail is 40% uh, has places for people with mental health. I mean, a lot of the people that are in prison and that are arrested off the street just have a very serious mental health that is untreated. And it maybe is untreatable sometimes. So. They, everybody who goes into the jail, everyone who's arrested is analyzed for those problems. And if they are, if they fall into the category, they will go into the hospital part and they will be treated. And locally, and I'm sure here as well, we're developing more comprehensive care response teams so that what might look like criminal activity or, or danger, you know, that we identify the mental health and so we don't criminalize mental health, right, by responding, over responding. With, police action and such, but we have folks who can identify and recognize those signs and, and have the right kinds of strategies to help de-escalate situations so that folks get to, to the care they need, not to, to prison if that's not going to feel right. Dr. Mack, you address so comprehensively all the ways in which we can identify and help those in poverty after we have found them there. What is your thought on how to cure it in the beginning and lessen the number of children in poverty? Yeah. What, what would you say we can do before it happens? Yeah, well, that's the goal, of course, right? We're pretty good at treating things after the fact, right? We're sorry. In crisis mode, but how do you get ahead of it, right? So, I mean, we focus a lot on children, right? Uh, children are not responsible for the homes uh, that they're in. Um, there are caregivers in children's lives, and teachers, uh, you know, uh, and others who can be those caring, competent adults, right? Uh, parents don't always have the competency, right? We, we recognize that. So how how can we, you know, how can we increase the marriages? How can we increase the church? 
how can we increase the work yeah. ethic? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Anything you do it to increase love, I think, um, and that's expressed in a variety of ways, including you know, after-school programs, summer programs, where you create opportunities for those caring, competent adults. Everyone who's here can be that for somebody else, right? And we've done it for our own kids, but we got more in, more in the tank, right? Um, we can show up and, as you say, just teach things that we know that have worked for our families. Um, we can do that. One and it matters. One of the things that we've found is just you're working with someone who's bitter and angry and tired and poor. And I will say what you just said, love just opens the door. I mean, that is the essence of our approach to these people are that we care about them. And that's why we're there and we respect them. They really don't get respect. <laughs> not a lot of respect in prison. Um, so uh, that really, respect and love is huge. Kids remember kindness, right? You know? Especially when it's not a regular occurrence in their home, right? So we can do that. Thank you. Um, first, in answer to your question, I went to a talk a couple of months ago. I can't tell you the numbers, but an awful lot of data on the value of pre-K childhood education, early childhood development. That was really huge in terms of preventing incarceration. A lot of the stuff we're talking about. So that was that answer. Uh, that's one thing at least. My right, question for you, Dr. Nick. Um, you have a lot of experience with college-age kids. Uh, any thoughts on similar type of exposure and education for grade school age kids, either ideas yourself or maybe books or people who, who have done that successfully? We've got a K through 8 school right here. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to have similar indoctrination and education for people at a younger age. Yeah, you can't start too early, right? right? By just introducing the practice of kindness and love and understanding and recognizing difference in others, right? I think there's more and more books, so children's level books that, that help households and schools have those kinds of conversations that help change the story, right? Set a positive story and, and um, so that's helpful. I'll say that I do a high school program. I do kind of an expedited two week. We have something called Summer Scholars at Notre Dame where students swoop in and get the college experience for two weeks. And um, I was reluctant at first. I thought, mm, two weeks, um, high school, you know, um, is this going to work? Oh my gosh. I mean, they're so receptive at that age, I can tell you, uh, to thinking about these things. They haven't thought about it, right? So. I, but yeah, we keep going younger, right? If it works for high school school students, maybe there is a program or something that, that can can a version of that. I don't know. I don't have a specific curriculum for that. I can say that I, you know, a pared down version of those same questions. Like the sooner you ask these questions, um, uh, their answers will be different developmentally, but they can answer and they can engage and just kind of opens their eyes to things. 